G'day, g'day, and welcome back to another episode of The Experience. We're here again in the studio, but today we're across the screen with a very special guest on Zoom. This lady is from, I guess you could say, the twin of Wollongong up in Newey, Newcastle on the coast there. So similar to where we are here in Wollongong. And she's doing some amazing things. She is the founder of a marketing agency, La La Social Club who are tackling social and digital marketing in such a special way. And I'm looking forward to diving into all of that today because that is the world we live in now. Social, digital, everything is online. Businesses are growing. Brands are growing. People are growing on these spaces through the screen of a phone. And I'm excited to learn a whole heap myself, but take that little bit of education, inspiration and throw it onto you guys, the audience, the very loyal listeners and viewers of the experience. So Without further to do, from your home, your car, or wherever you are, give a very warm welcome to the very lovely Laura Higgins from La La Social Club. How are you, Laura? So good. Thank you, Bradley. Thanks for having me today. My absolute pleasure. It's great to finally be here. We've teed this up probably two or three months ago now. We've sort of gone back and <laughs> forth over a date, and finally we're here. So not without a oh little, my bit gosh. Of, um, little bit of fuss. You were trying to get the, the AirPods working for the first little bit there, and <laughs> I know that I know the bloody struggle that that is, and I actually forgot my pod today, and I've rocked up to the office with one AirPod, so that's no. going to be a later <laughs> on today. So I, I feel where you're coming from. Yes. Well, I just got the um, noise cancelling AirPods, AirPod Pros, and they are so good. I'm like, I'll be like in my office going, guys. I can't hear you. I'm yeah. sorry. That's great. That's <laughs> Don't great. talk to me. Sometimes I won't even have music on. I'm just, I'm just have the noise cancelling bit on. Just it's purely. Like at the gym. <laughs> if I'm at the gym and yes. mine die, I leave them in because I'm like, I'm going to get some peace and quiet here for the next hour. This is great. Yes, totally. So hey, I'm <laughs> so really, good. really, really thankful to have you sitting across from me because like I said, there's a, a whole heap that I believe I could learn from you. And I know plenty of brands and businesses are already doing that. But I want you to give us firstly a little bit of a rundown on your story. How did you get to where you are now? You're obviously quite young. You can see that and you're running a company and having some great success and doing some incredible things. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey just to, I guess, give the audience some credentials and, and pump yourself up a little bit. <laughs> well, I started my business when I was um, 23. I um, kind of actually kind of fell into it a little bit. I'd studied graphic design at Newcastle University, which again is a lot like Wollongong. Newcastle is a coastal kind of, you know, it was always growing up, it was always called Steel City because it was a big mining town. Um, and now it's it's definitely more progressive than that and, it, and it's a super fun place to live. But I, I started, I studied, actually finished school, went into, um, started studying journalism realized that wasn't for me because in a tutorial I had one of my tutors say to me are you even going to get you said to the whole class is journalism even a profession anymore are you even going to get a job when you finish this degree I don't know and I remember just being like what are we doing here so I <laughs> quickly was like I'm never coming back and then I moved into graphic design I'd always been really creative. I'd always loved writing. I'd always been interested in photography and design. And, and then I, um, from there, again, realized this isn't my vibe. This isn't, this isn't for me. And my problem was, uh, you know, and, and I perceived this as a problem. I was a bit of a generalist. I, I was kind of good at, you know, I wasn't like incredible at design or an incredible writer. I was kind of a generalist at all of these things. And so then when social media came to be like a thing that businesses would start using, I realized actually this is kind of a, a mix of all these skill sets that, that I have. And, you know, I was always interested in branding. I was always interested in, in how things looked and how, how things felt um, in terms of brand. So it was this kind of weird mix of all of these things that I love, all of these things that I was good at. And so I started working for a coffee roaster because my background was in coffee. I was a barista um, in the process of all of this and started working for a coffee roaster. And we realized that Instagram is a really good business tool. And this was years ago. And 
so from there, their Instagram, you know, took off. It went crazy. And people started asking, how the heck did you do that? What, what, what's your approach? How are you doing this? And I realized that there was a gap and that people needed help in not just one facet of their business when it came to marketing, but they needed help with all of it. You know, I realized that online marketing isn't just, it's not enough to just have a good website or to have really great emails or to have really great content on social media or a killer Instagram. It's actually about all of those things coming together into a really cohesive plan. And so from there, I I started La La Social Club. We worked with small businesses who really wanted to cut through the noise in their marketing. And now I train small business small business owners and particularly service providers on how to actually create a repeatable marketing system using their emails, using their copywriting, their brand, their look and feel, content on social media and their message. And really about, it's really about creating this holistic approach to marketing because as I said, it's not just one area needs to be good. It's kind of like, if you think about marketing like a wheel, if you have epic social media, but your website sucks, you're not going to get conversions and there's no point building your social media, right? And if you think about it like a wheel, it's kind of wonky. So if one spoke of the wheel is social media or email marketing or your copywriting or your content, but the other ones aren't strong, then you're doing all of this work and you're not getting anywhere anyway. So that's really what I help people to do is to create a really repeatable, balanced, holistic marketing system that that gets them results for their small business. That's amazing to hear. And I want to really, I guess, dive into one of those words that you you said, I was going to say that you repeated and it was repeatedly. And I guess repeatedly is a way of you saying consistency. But I have Mm. to ask with consistency, obviously, there's the the importance and the stress of consistently posting consistently emailing and and using all of those spokes of that wheel to reach your customers or your clients. But how important is consistency of a message or of an actual detailed plan that gives people, I guess, the same message, not just once, but a number of times? Uh, It's so important, Bradley, because when you think about it, there is so much noise online, right? Every day we're inundated with messages, whether it's Facebook ads that we're seeing, whether it's like, think about there's this constant stream of content. You look at streaming platforms like Netflix and Spotify, we have more content than we could ever consume in our lifetime. So the importance of repetition and the importance of creating something memorable and consistent, it's become way more important now because We don't have the luxury of people just going, oh, okay, I've seen that brand once. Now I trust them. It's actually, no, we, we, brands need to see you, uh, people, sorry, your customers need to see you a number of times before they even take action. And so if, if small business owners and if entrepreneurs are changing their message, changing their brand, changing their, their approach all the time, people don't actually know what you're known for. And when, when people don't know what you're known for, then they can't take action because when there's not trust and when there's not clarity on exactly what you do, it's really hard for your audience to take action. So definitely the repetition part of the process is where a lot of people don't do the work and also where a lot of, you know, and I'm guilty of this, entrepreneurs and, and creatives and business owners we like new things, right? We, we love like the, um, we love jumping into the new thing. We love jumping into the next thing, but really to see success, it really takes going, all right, I'm going to focus on this one thing. I'm going to become known for this one thing. And that's where, you know, defining your niche is so important. It's really about focus and repetition for sure. Without doubt, I am extremely guilty of that. I love something that's a little bit new and flashy and I'm an ideas man. So I'm consistently throwing new things at the dartboard and just hoping I hit a bullseye, but probably not consistently enough just hitting those high scores and those things that 
constantly seem to work and seem to be, I guess, a consistent part of me growing my audience on this platform. And, and I can imagine it's much the same for brands and businesses in their fields of expertise. One thing I noted that you said there is you spoke about the importance of a really powerful message, something that you become known for in your business or your brand. Do you think that, because I can kind of see maybe a little bit of a transition here from the in, sort of looking from the outside in. There's someone who's no expert on marketing and has never worked in that field, worked in sales for a fair bit of my life. But I noticed sort of if you look back at say like, you know, you watch shows like Mad Men, you know that Mad Men era and like the old TV billboard commercials, you used to see the people sitting in the boardroom in a suit and, suit and ties pitching ad ideas, what was going to be the new, the next catchy thing or the new thing on TV that we all consistently seen and ended up spending our money on. I kind of feel like it went away from that for a minute with social in its earlier stages where anything could be a hit because it was a lack of, I guess, supply on a very demanding platform where it had a lot of consumers. But it seems like now where social media is flooded with content, the importance of sitting back almost in that hypothetical boardroom and pitching the idea that's going to be a consistent push, that idea is probably more paramount than ever, right? Absolutely. And I think the the allure of social media and I think probably culture um, in general now, right? Like you think about fashion, brands, brands would bring out a new line once a year right? And, or maybe it was like a winter line and a summer line. Now it's like, they need to do eight collections a year, eight new collections in an average, like, I mean, minimum, sorry. So think about like how fast things move now. So what, what happens with, you know, and I don't think it, you know, fashion is an example of that, how fast things need to, people get over things, right? So I think we're, we're kind of battling against this thing of there's so much noise online, there's also this kind of 24 hour news cycle loop that we're in where it, it, everything changes every single day. And it feels like as business owners, we can be a little reactive and we can become a bit like, well, I have no idea what I'm saying or anything I'm going to say or, or any campaigns I want to run, particularly in COVID, can be upended in, in a day and it can feel like, well, that whole thing's a waste. So I think there's this thing of, we feel like, oh, if I invest the time into really developing a campaign or an idea or a message that it's, I have to then do all that work over again next week. You know, it feels like it needs to be that, that quick. But I would say the brands, think about the brands that you love. You think about Google, you think about Apple, like these brands, they, their message hasn't really changed. Yes, their delivery and their method has changed for a lot of them, but their message has stayed the same. And, and they are the best brands in the world and they're the best businesses. So if we're thinking about whilst our content and our, the, the types of delivery that we have may change, I think at the end of the day, your message shouldn't change that much. Your message really needs to, to be consistent. And so the brands that stick, the brands that really are memorable and really cut through the noise are the ones that really stick to their guns. And, and as you say, like that proverbial boardroom where they sit and go, what do our people want? What's going to engage our people? How do we communicate that? That's the, they're the types of campaigns. They're the types of initiatives that really start to see traction online for sure. I love it. Um, really interested, I guess, as a, in like we said in a really content heavy world there's always the question you know is there still opportunity to get organic growth with your marketing mm -hmm. what's the importance of paid marketing but also where do you see influencer marketing fitting in for most brands and businesses in 2021 that is such a good question and i think for me my approach is a blend of organic and paid. I really believe that social media has become pay to play. I think that when people kind of go, oh, I don't want to do paid ads. It's like, well, your competitors are doing paid ads. Your competitors are retargeting people when they visit their website. So they're staying top of mind for your customer, 
And so at the end of the day, I, I really believe that it is important to have a paid strategy as much as it is about an organic strategy. What I see a lot of small businesses do is give away too much in trying to add value, which I love because it's so important in social media in particular to be adding value to your customer. And because adding value builds trust, trust means that people are more likely to buy from you because we're not in business as charity, right? Like we're not, we're not here to just create a nice little community, write some blogs every now and again, start, you know, just connect with people. That's lovely. <laughs> but I don't know about you, but I'm in this business to, to help more people. And the only way I can really, really help people is if they sign up for what I'm doing and, and do my paid programs, because it's actually about the best way to serve people is to get them into a, a position where they invest their money. And it's not so much because financially you need that. That's obviously part of it. That's why we're in business. But, but I think as well, it's when people invest their money, that means that they are investing their time. That means they're investing their energy. And, and it's really important that people invest financially into what we do, right? Definitely. If it's a good fit for them. So I guess my point is like, it's really important that we, whilst it's so good to have organic and organic strategy, and I've built my whole business on an organic strategy for Instagram, that's really important. But I think if I were building my profile now from zero, I would be running ads from day one. I would be going, okay, cool. I want to attract these types of people. Instagram and Facebook know more about my people than I do. I'm going to invest money into to building that audience. And then, you know, you can have an organic roll-on roll effect from there. Definitely doing things like reels is a really great organic strategy, but it needs to be coupled with retargeting campaigns that are paid. It needs to be coupled with, okay, I'm, I'm going to promote a lead magnet so that I can get people into my email list. So it's, as I said, it's not just one. I think the problem I see a lot of small businesses like come across is that they put all their eggs in one basket and often they give away too much valuable content for free on a platform that they don't own. So I'd rather you be giving away great helpful content in your email list because that's an audience you own. So I think it's having the distinction of, yes, we want to be generous 100%. And, and I'm, I'm such a believer in being that being generous in business is the only way to do business. I really believe that. But I also think we need to be strategic. So when it comes to creating content, when it comes to where we share our content, I think having a strategy for your organic, your paid, having a strategy for your emails, that is really where you start to see results for sure. I could not agree with you more. And that has been a massive learning curve for me in the past couple of months. Like I left a consistent paying job in real estate. This is my dream. Like I love storytelling. I love sharing other people's stories, my story to hopefully have positive impact, <clears throat> excuse me, on the people that tune into the experience. And whilst I provide all of that content for free, and I've got to say the amazing and grateful DMs I get mean more than any paycheck I ever receive, but unfortunately they don't pay the home loan. So <laughs> it's a part of the yes. learning curve that, I've experienced in the last few months where you really need to have, like you said, that generous approach, but yes, the, the strategy behind it to convert that to a successful business. And so I feel like this is going to lead to me sitting down for a conversation with you, Arthur, because I can see there's a lot of helpful stuff you could help me with, um, which I'm pumped to talk about. But while we're here on the pod, I want to talk about that approach and, and building that audience and growing it and nurturing it. There's so many platforms do you believe that you should be utilizing every one of them or should you pick your maybe two or three and go in hard on those I know we spoke about picking the message and finding the message and being consistent with that but when we come to I get platform diversification and you know it's kind of hard to figure out where to spend your time that is such a good question and and I think it can feel a little bit frenetic. I don't know if you feel like that, Bradley, but I, I do this for a job and I, I looked at Clubhouse and was like, okay, cool. I have to sit on here and listen to people talking. Like I was just like, no, I can't, you know, 
I just realized quickly, okay, this is a really powerful platform and I wish I had the headspace for it, but I don't. You know, for me, I also run a podcast. We really focus on Instagram. We focus on our email list. We're trying to build our LinkedIn and also a bit of Pinterest stuff as well. So in my head, when it came to Clubhouse, when it came to TikTok, I just went, that's not my game. I'm, I'm going to just, for now, I'm just going to go, that's not my zone. And I think, you know, in business, we need to know where our people are hanging out. That's the first thing. So having clarity on exactly who your customer is helps you to know, okay, well, do I need to be on Clubhouse? Do I need to be on TikTok? Or are my people not really there? And so it's about having that self-awareness as well to go, am I spreading myself too thin by, and am I being realistic? How much can I add value if I'm not even present on those platforms? So I think it's about, I really think for me personally, I do better when I have focused attention on something. I already feel like I get a bit distracted by social media. So for me, adding extra platforms, it it can kind of feel like, well, that that's just going to be counterproductive for me. So it really depends on your business. It really depends on your personality as well. Because Bradley, like for instance, you might absolutely nail Clubhouse. I don't know if you use Clubhouse, but I can imagine you'd be epic on that. But it's it's about finding, okay, well, where are my people? Where, where are my strengths? And also, do I have enough time? Is this going to be spreading myself too thin? It's funny you say that because Clubhouse has been one that I've probably similarly to you battled with the idea I loved at first and you know it felt a little bit exclusive you get an invite you're one of the few and you kind of put up who's got clubhouse and everyone's like what's that and how do I get an invite and I'm like well I kind of already got one and you know it feels all <laughs> a bit exclusive and special the thing is though when you consume podcast content and you can get incredible interviews for free anyways I think for me I've figured out that clubhouse is going to be more of that potentially few very big names getting together once a month I jump on and listen to like a virtual conference that could be very helpful for me in my my endeavors and for chasing my dream and something that's going to really help me however I don't feel like I personally can get around it every day because I listen to enough content through the form of podcast anyways and it feels far more personal to have a consistent podcast or a few that you go to and you understand their messaging and the way they go about it. So I completely agree with you. And I think that is the battle for most people in today's society. There is so many options that, you know, it's like sitting in a restaurant with a big menu. You spend 40 minutes trying to figure out what you <laughs> eat and you probably just wanted a pizza or a schnitzel anyways. So exactly, it's, it's so true. So for me, it's something I'm looking to, I guess, hone in, hone in on that particular place where I'm going to spend my time and put a lot of my effort I want to talk about the do's and don'ts on things like Instagram and TikTok. We see the phenomenon of the hashtag, like the amount of hashtags that I see people using. We talk about the algorithm and there's this constant like effort to break the Da Vinci code. Like (coughs) what is the algorithm? How do we break it? How do we figure it out? Some people seem like they have it. I don't know whether it's luck or whether it's very intelligent strategy. Can you touch on those two things, hashtags and algorithms? Totally. I, (laughs) this might be a little controversial, but for me, hashtags are a one percenter. So I really focused on, I really focus on actually understanding your customer and creating content that visually and verbally communicates really clearly. I think it's less about, it's less about little hacks and it's more about okay do you have a strategy for your content do you have a strategy for your messaging when are you posting what do your customers want to hear from you and and I focus more on that than hashtags algorithm those types of things what I will say on the algorithm front is anytime you adopt a new feature that Instagram or Facebook or whatever platform Anytime you adopt a new feature that they release, you are going to be favoured by the algorithm. You're going to have favour <laughs> with the algorithm because they spend so much money building these features, right? And so they want more and more people to start using them. So when, 
and we saw this when Instagram reels came out, when the Instagram stories came out, the people who jumped on it first, their content was seen by so many people. So I will say, you know, we've got to be clever. We've got to be clever with how we approach Instagram in particular. And so for me, it's about, okay, jumping on the new trends. That's not to say you have to dance and point or mime or do any of those weird things in reels if, if that's not on brand for you. For me personally, that is not on brand for me and I won't do it. I kind of feel like, and again, Bradley, this is me being so honest, but, but I feel like a monkey doing that. I feel so silly. You know, I feel like I'm an intelligent woman. Why am I, why am I dancing and to this weird song and like pointing? It feels unintelligent to me. And I'm sorry, that might be really judgy, but it just feels really um, like it oversimplifies what we do and it, and it makes things. And, and I, I particularly just feel like the oversimplification and the reducing what you know into a couple of little statements. For me, that's not, that's not good marketing that's clickbait. I feel like it's, it's a really, there's such a fine line between, you know, going with the trends, which I think is important to adopt new features, but you don't have to follow every trend, you know, and, and I think TikTok has made it that things go, things are trending and then it kind of falls into businesses to do the same thing. And I, I just don't think you need to do that. You can do that, but I don't think if that's not on brand for you, you don't have to do that. So whilst we're playing to the algorithm, we're, we're being strategic, we're optimizing our content as much as we can for the algorithm. That means posting, taking up as much real estate as possible, posting in the right sizes, posting the content that the algorithm loves. So videos, making sure that you're using reels, you're using stories, all of those things. 100% do that. But don't sacrifice the integrity of your brand to kind of get a bit of a kick from the algorithm, if that makes sense. It definitely makes sense. And I guess I can cancel my 12.30 to duet Addison Ray on TikTok, <laughs> which is a relief. That is a big relief. I am so sorry. I just, no, very, I, no, very, no, I'm kidding. Very similar to you. I am <laughs> no dancer. I am, that. that is not me and it has definitely never been. And I am known to take the piss out of myself, but I'm definitely not <laughs> known to go serious and, and dance on those platforms. But it's something that is is becoming quite visible. You can see people almost selling their soul on social media to be trending, to be what they believe they have to. And here's, here's the issue that I find. I can almost see that somebody would jump on a trend and it may be something that I'm into. It may be something that I'm not. And I watch their growth, but all of a sudden they hit a point where they feel they now have the growth to actually be themselves then they wonder why their audience drops off. Well, that's not what you built your brand because of. And now like the messaging is mixed and you've sent the wrong signal. Totally. So that's where I feel the issue lies. I have, a, I have a great question and a question that I guess for me is it, it's hard. It's hard to maybe potentially not want to hear the answer that you have to say here, but <laughs> as someone who enjoys podcasting far and wide, like I kind of, I feel like I get to do three things here on the podcast and that's, educate not through myself but through my guests um entertain with the people that i have on whether it be humorous banterful or light-hearted um podcast guests or podcast episodes that i put out or maybe it's getting someone like yourself where we get to have a little bit of a laugh in between some of the educational stuff today <laughs> or whether it's inspiring people to to take leaps of faith in their life and you know lead a life full of purpose and relentlessly pursue that and that's for me one of the bigger messages in all that I do but I'm very far and wide and I love sitting here you know this will be episode I believe 80 of my podcast and in 80 episodes there is such great diversity and that's something that I love because I feel that I'm kind of a jack of all trades and no real expert as you said earlier in the podcast however notably I have friends and and fellow guests that have been on this podcast a gentleman like joe damon who's a comedian a very good one over in new zealand and he has grown his brand very quickly through comedy 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 he has that niche he has that particular style of comedy that his audience finds him love him for that and they consistently get fed that kind of content what is the importance of having a niche or can you be far and wide and still successful in this game of social media content and branding? This again is such a good question. 
and I'll tell you a bit about my story. So I, I recently, so I'm a marketing strategist, right? So I mostly work with small businesses, but I recently um, was interviewing someone um, for my podcast and he is a sales expert. He's really good at presenting and, and selling. And so at the end of the podcast, and I don't know if you have this Bradley, but like often at the end of the podcast, you kind of get free coaching. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, I was like, anyway, so here's where I'm up to with my business. And, and he was like, Laura, I think you're too broad. And this was, this was maybe a month ago. And I was like, okay, I think you're right. And so I started thinking about it and he was like, small business isn't niche enough. You need to niche down further. And, and so then for me, I started to think about, okay, well, who do I really love working with and, and who do I really serve? And it really became clear to me that it's actually service providers. So people in fitness, people in health and beauty, pe like people who are providing a service, not so much e-commerce or product-based businesses. So for me, just defining that a little more has given me a lot more confidence on, okay, these are the people I do work with. These are the people I really can help. And on the other side, and equally as important, I know that, okay, I can't help people who are in e-commerce. That's not my strength. My strength is in communication and particularly for service providers. So I really understand that, that zone. And so in niching it down even further, I realized, well, actually it's service providers, but it's actually service providers within the lifestyle space. So fitness, construction, health, beauty, like it's really specific. Okay. So when, when we're thinking about niche, you can go far and wide. If you have something that really ties it together, that's very clear. So with, with what you do, like I think about um, Jordan Harbinger, Harbinger, Harbinger. Do you know, I know him? The, I know the name. <laughs> I just, I know the I've name, just butchered I his name. He, he actually kind of reminds me of you a bit. Like he interviews, he interviews like guests across all different areas of life. Like he interviewed Malcolm Gladwell. Like he's, he's interviewed all these authors, all these, you know, entertainers, famous people. And, and it's kind of like, you don't feel like it's weird because there's this common thread that he asks similar questions. He's a really great interviewer and, and he, his niche is almost that he's the everyday person asking these crazy successful people, what, what's your secret essentially. And so I think if your niche is, your niche can be, you can interview whoever, you can speak to whoever, but so long as there's a common thread of, well, the, the, the experience on your show is, well, I always ask these types of questions and my perspective is always about these things. So I think it's, it's okay to kind of serve a bunch of people, a big range of people, so long as your angle is, is quite defined, if that makes sense. I'm sweating a little less after hearing that. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> no, I think what you're doing makes a lot of sense. I think it's, and, and where I see people go wrong is when they go really niche and then they start to expand and then they lose their audience because their audience are like, what? I was here to talk about money and now you're talking about something totally random, yeah. you know? So it, I think if, you're, if your angle is really clear and if your perspective and position is really clear as the interviewer, then that's your niche, I think. And I, I mean, having said that, I've just been having, I've been learning more about this recently because I've had this, you know, feedback of someone saying you're not niche enough. And, and um, now I'm on the kind of experience of, okay, well, I've got to figure out how to make it really clear for people because people want to know what you're known for. Yeah. It's such a constant journey. And I think people need to know, as I said earlier, they need to know what you're for. And so I would just be asking the question, okay, how do I want people to feel when they listen to my podcast? How do I want, what do I really want to be known for? And, and this goes for anyone in business. How do I want people to feel when they encounter my business? And what do I want to be known for? They're the two questions I'd be asking. I love it. And I think two very important questions for anyone listening.
I want to ask, I want to go back and just backtrack a little bit. We spoke about before pay to play in social media and how important that is with a mix of organic, but of course, to really grow, like you said, your competitors will be using paid marketing. The way I see it and the, the question that I have here is almost, well, in many ways, most of us have a little bit of money to play with. However, is social media marketing and digital marketing quite like a game of poker where there's a genuine number that you need to buy in and maybe if you don't have that, just continue to play the free game? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, you know, for me, I generally say to people, if you can afford, you know, as a starting base level, if you have a really high performing piece of content, my first strategy for people with paid ads is, okay, cool. You've got a great piece of content that performed really well organically, right? So say you did a social post and you got a bunch of comments, you looked at your insights and you're like, man, there's heaps of saves on that. There's heaps of comments that is the ad, that's the post you want to promote. So what you want to do is you want to go into Facebook ads, ads manager, and create what's called an engagement ad. And this is really simple to do. It's a really great place to start for anyone who's like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to run ads. I'm sick of just boosting posts, right? Because I'm not talking about boosting or promoting within Instagram. We're talking about running campaigns. But engagement ads are so good because what you have on that post that performed really well, the post with all the comments, with, with a bunch of likes, is you have social proof. So that means that people feel like it's less, um, it feels like less of an ad, right? Because it kind of feels more organic because it has that initial organic um, engagement. So then what you want to do is you want to start with 10 bucks a day. Really simple. It doesn't have to be huge. You can start with $10 and then you, you work your way up from there. But if you think about it, that's 300 bucks a month. That's really manageable. If you're running a business, you know, that's a business expense. It's really manageable just to stay top of mind for people, right? That's the whole purpose of, of that type of ad campaign. You're not trying to get them to sign up to something. There's no call to action. It's purely to stay top of mind. And I think what happens when people invest that and when you start to see the engagement from that, that's when you can then feel a bit more confident to go, all right, Now I want to promote something that is a conversion, that is like signing up to get a lead magnet, signing up to a program, booking a call, scheduling an appointment or whatever the the conversion is. That's when you kind of can come to those types of ad campaigns with a bit more confidence and a bit more clout because you've already run smaller types of ads ongoing and, and you've tested the waters a bit more. So for anyone who's starting out, I would just recommend try an engagement ad, start at 10 bucks a day, see what your results are and and use an existing post that's already done well. That's a really easy way to do it. I love it. I think very good tip and something I'll definitely be playing with this week in the next couple of days. Totally. I want to sort of, I feel like there's so much valuable content just there in that, that little 30 minute piece of this podcast that will be firstly, easily applied to people's businesses and brands, but also very easy to understand where maybe they're going wrong and and where they need to start focusing their energy, which is, I think is very important. I thank you for that. I want to step away from, I guess, the advice and your level of expertise and, and go in a little bit personal on you as a business person as a whole. And for those business owners and those brand managers that are sitting there and listening to this, I can imagine that there's also a real struggle to find balance in life and balance the needs to be working consistently and putting out good quality all the time and getting the most out of their life. You know, balance is so important. It's essential. And it's what keeps us going, you know, at a high level of intensity all the time, you know, So talk to me about some of the anchors in your life that allow you to be your best when you step into the office and you put those noise cancelling AirPod Pros in. (laughs) Well, definitely the AirPods. They help me a lot, cancelling out the noise. Um, Do you know what? I, I have been a bit sick this week and I had this moment, and you can probably hear I sound a bit sick. I had this moment this week where I was, I couldn't, I had all these meetings booked. I had all these things scheduled and I honestly never get sick and I feel very blessed that I I really don't get sick very often. 
But this week I was like, oh my gosh, I can't take a day off. And that really, um, it really frustrated me, but it also really made me feel like, what's the, why am I running this business if I can't take a day off, you know, if I'm sick? And, you know, thankfully all my clients and all the people I work with are beautiful and we just rescheduled stuff. But it really made me think, okay, this isn't sustainable if I can't take a day off. You know, obviously I take weekends off, but I, I was really that was a real um, confronting moment for me where I thought, I don't know why I'm working so hard if I can't take a sick day, you know? So I think for me, it's, you know, that's in all honesty, that's where I'm at this week. I've been really thinking about, okay, well, how does this business work for me? I don't, I don't just want to, you know, I heard someone say something recently where they were like, I left my job to become my own boss. I don't want to have, you know, 10 other bosses that are my clients or you know the people that I work with and it can kind of feel like that sometimes and and so I think it's really going okay I run the business the business doesn't run me and in really having the confidence to say no for me that has been such a big journey that's one that I'm learning regularly <laughs> I think I'm permanently learning okay that one I should have said no to and and you know like having those boundaries is a big thing. And, and I think in answer to your question around balance, I think it's such a process. And I think I, I've, I also rethink the idea that work-life balance um, looks the same way for everyone. You know, I think um, if you're a driven person and if what you're doing is something that you love, you will work 80 hours a week and kind of make it work because you love it. So I think, you know, the idea of people going, well, you're working too much. It's like, no, I'm just doing something that I love. So there is a balance of actually going, well, what does, what season am I in? What's the level that I can commit to this right now? And, and what does the business require of me? And what do I require of the business? You know, I think, it's, it's this um, dynamic that, that we're permanently, it's this dance, I think. So I think in terms of achieving balance, I think it's about knowing where you're at, knowing your season, knowing, knowing what's required of you and, and prioritizing the season that you're in and rolling with the season that you're in rather than going, oh my gosh, I need to, there are seasons where I, I think I, I am working 80 hours a week and it's great because we're prepping for this course that we're about to release. We're growing, we're hiring, and that's great. And I think it, it's also, there are other times where it's like, oh man, I, if I do 38 hours, I'll be stoked. <laughs> you know. So I think it's this balance of knowing your season and knowing what, what's required at that time and not being so hard on yourself. That's actually a theory I've been speaking a lot about lately with a few close mates, the idea of seasons and professional athletes have an off season, a pre-season and an in season where they go hard. And I think for some reason in life, we don't seem to have that or don't seem to understand the importance of it. So I, I really love that message there. And I love those four questions. What season am I in? What intensity does my business require? What do I require of my business? And what does my business require of me? I love that. And I think that's a really good little piece of advice in some maybe some questions you should ask yourself once every week or once every month in your business to make sure you're getting the absolute best out of yourself and what you're doing. Totally. I've totally. had a little bit of a trend on my social the last like two weeks where I bother the staff down here at Lee and me, particularly young Jonah for words of wisdom in the morning. And I like to put <laughs> everyone on the spot and ask them some words of wisdom to see whether we get some humor or maybe something very inspirational. So for all the listeners and viewers of the experience who have tuned into this episode here today, does Laura Higgins have some words of wisdom that will maybe, I don't know, maybe this is a viral TikTok waiting to happen. Maybe we're starting <laughs> our own trend here. Addison Ray, book us in because you need a duet this. Words of wisdom with Laura Higgins. Oh, look, I would say my big words of wisdom would be there is so much you can learn. There's always more you can learn, but it's about just doing it. You know, I think 
done is so much better than perfect. And this is something I learn all the time. You know, every day it feels like I have to remind myself there is always more I can learn. There's always more books I can read, more podcasts I can listen to, courses I can do. But at the end of the day, if I'm not doing the work, if I'm not implementing, then what's the point? You know, I think it's just really important to be doing the work and momentum Momentum builds more momentum. And I think it's that it's really important in your career, in your business, in your personal life to actually go, all right, I'm just going to take one step at a time and I'm going to build momentum slowly or whatever pace you want to, but I'm just going to keep moving. I'm going to keep doing the things that I need to do. Done is so much better than perfect. I absolutely love it. And I'm going to make sure that for everyone listening here today or viewing on YouTube that all of Laura's social links and also the social links and website to La La Social Club are in today's show description because I want to make sure that you not only hear this little bit of wisdom and all the education in today's episode, but you go and apply it to your life and you have the, the resources there to dive in and speak to Laura and her team further. Thank you so much for being here, Laura. I appreciate it so much and plenty I've gained from today and I know plenty that the audience will too. Thank you so much for having me, Bradley. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. No, the pleasure's all mine. Make sure you guys go subscribe, rate and review. You know, we love those good reviews and we love you guys who listen. Take care.